Our Holy Father, what a blessing it is this morning to be in your presence, to be with our brothers and sisters in Christ, with guests that are here, to lift our voices and praise your name. Father, you are so good, and you are so good to us, and what a blessing it is to be able to be called your children. Father, today as we come together, our hearts are thankful because of the sacrifice of your son and our Savior. And for what that means to us. Because Father, we know that there is nothing that we can do to be forgiven of our sins on our own. But it took His sacrifice and Your grace For that to happen and father we thank you so much for your plan we thank you so much for your love for us and for what you even had to endure for that sacrifice to take place father as clay has already said uh, we've been fortunate to be blessed with warmth food the things that we need, but so many over the last week have been without those things and some have even lost their lives. And Father, we're just mindful of all those that are struggling through this. And we just pray that uh, we be mindful of any that we're able to help and be willing to do just that. Father, may we see in this that you are all powerful. And what really matters in this life is having you in the place in our lives that you need to be. And we need you to be. And Father, we just pray that we can see the things that are important. And for sure put the emphasis in our lives there. Father, we're so grateful for everyone that is here this morning. Uh, There are some who have been able to come back this morning that have been out for quite some time because of uh, concern for health. But it is so good to be able to be back together with them and and just uh, just renew our time together in worship this morning. Father, thank you for this church, for the loving, giving hearts, for the servant hearts, for the talents and abilities you've given each one of us, and that everyone is willing to use their talents and serve you here. Father, that means so much. Just help us to grow in those talents and even to stretch ourselves in things that we maybe feel like sometimes we can't do. Just to grow and, and be able to be a blessing to others in their lives. Father, we love you. Again, we thank you for your grace. We know that we uh, sin and fail you and have thoughts and actions that are displeasing to you. And just pray that you will help us to hate sin. Help us to hate sin in our lives and sin around us and just to do all that we can to 
uh, remove it. Thank you for forgiveness. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. How are y'all doing this morning? It is truly a pleasure to be with you this morning, uh, especially after being held up in a dorm room for about a week, not being able to go anywhere. Uh, it is truly a blessing to be here to worship with you this morning. Um, and I also am grateful for the opportunity to speak this morning. So um, as we take a look at this picture on the screen, um, I, when I was assigned this scripture to speak on in Acts, the first thing that my mind went to when I thought about Peter's first sermon, when we hear the first preaching of the gospel on the day of Pentecost, is Perry Mason, as odd as that may seem. But the reason I thought of that, and it's not necessarily just Perry Mason, but it's, it's any TV show that may have a lawyer or a detective or someone that puts together information based on what they need to prove. And so the reason that my mind went to Perry Mason is he always had clever ways of figuring out how to prove that the person that was in the witness stand was the one who was guilty. And what ended up normally happening in the show is the person would absolutely refuse that they had anything to do with the situation. And he would have so much evidence on his side proving that they were guilty that inevitably they would just break down and say, okay, you know what, I was the one that did it. How did you figure it out? And that's kind of what Peter does here. If we want to go ahead and turn over to Acts chapter 2, we're going to be in verse 14 through 36 today. But he's compiling information, and he's trying to help the Jewish people that are gathered for Pentecost to understand that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, and that his blood and his death was on their shoulders, but that there was a purpose for it that there was a purpose for it. So, as we begin to look at this, I want to go ahead and set the stage for what we're going to be talking about. So, um, Pentecost, of course, was a festival celebrated by the Jews. It followed about 50 days after the festival that they celebrated as the Passover in commemoration of them being brought out of Egypt. And, of course, Jesus was crucified around the time of the Passover. He was the Passover lamb. So we're looking at about 50 days after the death of Jesus at this time. Um, the Jewish people were gathered, here we're talking about they were gathered in the temple. Um, and Peter and the other 11 apostles are standing among them. And, of course, before we get to this passage, we saw the baptism by the Holy Spirit. So 
the people are very confused because these men were speaking in languages that they had not studied. We know that most of them were Galileans, so they were uneducated people. So for these men to be speaking in these languages was hard to believe for many people. And so they came up with this reason, and, and many of them doubted. And they said, well, they're just drunk. They're filled with new wine. There's no other explanation than this. We're just, we're not going to accept this. They're just, they're filled with new wine. There's no working of God. They, they would not accept that. But Peter says, no, this is an act of God. This is happening for a purpose. Now, in the Old Testament, when we've seen the Spirit coming about in things from God, when God makes the Spirit to come upon people, we know that it happens in powerful ways and for powerful reasons. And so that ties into what we're going to talk about here with Joel chapter 2. One of the reasons that Peter approaches his sermon the way that he does here is because he knows that these Jewish people that are gathered here for Pentecost wouldn't know these things from the Old Testament. They would remember these examples of when the Spirit came upon people. And they would know this passage from Joel chapter 2. So when we look, starting in verse 17, Peter quotes from Joel chapter 2. But he changes a few words as he quotes it, that applies it and connects it to the situation. So if we look in verses 17 through 21, this is from Joel. In the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even on my male servants and my female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So what Peter's trying to get across here is God has told us that we're going to enter this time of the last days. And that when that time comes, the Spirit is going to come upon people, his servants. And they're going to prophesy through the Spirit. And he's saying, you need to take what you know, and you need to let God work through what you know. Because he told you this is going to happen. And it's happening right now. And you've got to understand that that's what's happening. And he's also saying that there's a plan, and here comes the fulfillment, and you're a part of it. The Spirit is normally the promise of the action of God. So like we said, the Spirit in the Old Testament came on people when God was saying, I'm going to take action. And God also promises action through he, Him raising Jesus and through Him empowering Jesus to perform miracles. This is all part of this prophecy from Joel, chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. And Peter is trying to reason with these people saying, I'm trying to bring you up to speed so you can understand that what's happening is what was already prophesied in the Old Testament. But this next section is what comes into major importance for the sermon's main point that Peter's going to try to make. In this next section between verses 22 and 36, he states several times, he makes this statement, this Jesus, this Jesus. Now, the people who are gathered here have probably heard of Jesus. I mean, it's pretty understandable that at this time, Jesus had pretty much turned the Jewish world upside down. He was heard of all over the world, at least the Jewish world, because of the changes he was bringing about, because of the authority that he taught with. And now, especially because of his death and his supposed resurrection, which many of the Jewish believers, and especially the Jewish authorities, were trying to proclaim that this was just his disciples stealing his body. So the people would have been very familiar with the story of Jesus at this time. So in verse 22, Peter says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. 
When we look at that passage, I want us to realize one thing. Humanity's action toward Jesus was crucifixion. But God's plan for Jesus was exaltation and resurrection. And what Peter's saying here is, you crucified him, but that was all part of the plan. And you didn't know it at that time. But there was a definite plan, and God had foreknowledge of what was going to happen. And you were part of the plan, but you were the ones who crucified him. You were the ones that killed him by the hands of lawless men. So let's pause for a minute and say, well, maybe let's look at the broader question and say, well, what is this plan? What is, what is Peter talking about here when he says that, that God had foreknowledge and he had a definite plan? Well, from the beginning of time, we know that God knew that we couldn't save ourselves. Since man fell in the garden, God knew that we could not save ourselves. That's the whole reason that he had to have a plan to save us, because he wanted to reconcile us back with him so we could have the relationship that he planned us and created us to have with him. God knew he had to do something about it. That just ties back in with what we just said. We couldn't do it on our own. And because he loved us and because he wanted us to have salvation, he had to do something about it. The plan was from the beginning, and Jesus was the plan. He was our propitiation, our ransom. Let's go ahead and turn over to Romans chapter 5, verse 8. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says, But God shows his love for us that in, while we were still sinners... Christ died for us. See, the idea here is while we were still his enemies, while we didn't love God, while we didn't act in a way that was pleasing to him, he had enough love for us and enough foreknowledge of the situation that we were in and the separation that we had in our sin that he was willing to send his son to die for us, to be our sacrifice. That was always the plan, and God knew that's what we needed. I like this quote, and I think it accurately describes the misunderstanding and the mindset of the Jewish people. God often works through humble circumstances and in unexpected ways to fulfill his plan and accomplish his mission to redeem his people. You know... In many circumstances in my life, I can say I never expected that God would use things in my life to turn out the way that they did. And I think as we look back through the scriptures, we can see that for other people as well. I mean, we have countless examples in Abraham and Moses and these people that came from humble beginnings that God used to create something great and something magnificent of his people that has brought us to this point today. And if it wasn't through humble circumstances, I don't believe that it would truly be the way that God had wanted it to be. But often it seems that God takes things that are the most humble and creates the thing that is most powerful and most effective and most unexpected that can bring about the best and most positive impacts. I'm just going to let you look at that picture for a minute and think about in your mind what, what looks wrong with that image. I think the simple answer would be it's out of focus, right? I want you to think about that as that is the view of the Jewish people towards Jesus as their Messiah. Their view of who the Messiah was supposed to be was so out of focus because they had something that they wanted to see and they were expecting, and God said, no. You need to trust me and you need to understand what the will is that I have because it's not about you, it's about me and what I have in store because this is my son and he is perfect in every way and he is your Messiah. See, the Jewish people were looking for a Messiah. 
that would come in power and glory and in a triumphant way and would establish his earthly kingdom to overthrow the Romans. That's what they were looking for, plain and simple. And we see that in many ways, especially when even Jesus' own followers were talking to him. They said when he was feeding the 5,000, they were ready to crown him king. And that wasn't Jesus' point. That's not why he came. And he even explains that to us. His kingdom is not of earth, but it's of heaven. The Jewish people were also looking for someone that would meet all of their expectations. And to be quite honest, their expectations were all held in the traditions of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They weren't scriptural expectations of who the Messiah should be. And so they only expected him to be a heresy. Another perspective I want you to think of at this time, when looking at a picture of Christ as being out of focus, is of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, because they only looked at Christ as he was taking away their power. In all senses of the word, they didn't care, really, whether he was the Messiah or not. They wanted to hold on to the power that they had gained from their people and that they were struggling to keep from the Romans. So from both sides of the story at that time, everybody was looking at Jesus with the wrong perspective. They were all expecting something of him that he wasn't, and they were all wanting him to be something that they wanted instead of what God had planned him to be. But for a moment, I also want us to think in ourselves how often do we see Jesus as this? How often do we want to take Jesus and say, okay, Jesus, here's your box. You need to fit within this. This is what I'm going to allow you to do. And this is what I'm going to expect you to be. And when I want you to be anything different, then I will take you out of the box and let you be what you need to be, what you are. And then when I want you to be different, then I'll just put you back in your box. I definitely know I'm guilty of doing that. I think we can all say that in a time in our life we've either done that with Jesus or with our relationship with God. And sometimes we don't allow him the room to work his plan, his foreknowledge, and the things that he knows that we need. I apologize for the red lettering being a little darker than I thought it would be, but it says the ultimate origin of the Christian mission lies in the act of God. That is why the Christian mission is a novum. It does not and it cannot arise naturally out of the mundane sphere, meaning people can't come up with it themselves. It doesn't make sense to us because we can't understand it. Death is the final boundary of natural life. I think we can all agree on that. That's what the Bible tells us, that because man fell and sinned in the garden, that we have death. But the idea of the Christian mission comes directly from the new life given by God to Jesus on the other side of death. The location of the origin of Christian mission according to Acts, that is, beyond death, and in this way Christian mission exceeds dramatically all human possibilities of creation and initiation. To sum that up in a little bit shorter and easier words, I guess you could say. We couldn't come up with this on our own. And because God has made this plan through the death of Jesus, it's far better than what we could ever imagine. And the blessing of Jesus' death that gives us life here and in eternity is dramatically beyond whatever is humanly possible. So now back to our text. We're going to go ahead and finish reading through our, our section here. We're going to pick it up, I believe, in verse 23. And we're going to go ahead and go through 36. And I just want you to take this time and really think about what Peter is saying to his audience here. Okay, After everything that we've established of their understanding of the Old Testament, of God's plan... And who Jesus is, let's begin reading in verse 23. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God has raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. 
Now, I'm going to pause for just a second before we read the next section. So now we're going to go back to that idea of referencing the Old Testament because Peter knows that's where his audience is coming from. So now we're going to talk, we're going to pull from Psalms. We're going to pull from David talking here. And, and he's going to bring them around to the understanding that he's talking about Christ and his prophecy. So verse 25, for David says concerning him, meaning Christ, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Now we're going to pause right there for a second. So now all these separate pieces that we just talked about are all coming together. Okay? So we started with God's plan. God's plan was to bring the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and let the, people, the apostles prophesy and speak in other languages that the people could hear the message of the gospel. And now they're saying here, now Peter is saying that God has raised Jesus up and being exalted to the right hand of God and receiving from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this, that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. So if we go back to the end of each gospel account when Jesus is ascending, he says that he has to leave so that the Holy Spirit can come, okay? So now we're seeing that from Joel's prophecy that in order for the Holy Spirit to come on the apostles, that Jesus had to be raised. So now Peter is taking each and every individual piece and putting it together to try to establish this argument to convince his audience that Jesus was the Christ and that they killed him. And he's saying here that even David prophesied about it, but he has raised, God has raised Christ and has not abandoned him to Hades, and he is the Christ. He says he is seated at the right hand of God. So now we're going to pick up in verse 34, and it says, For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And then here really comes the driving force that we have on the screen right now. Verse 36, Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus, whom you crucified. Peter doesn't say whom they crucified. And no, the people who are listening were probably not the people that drove the spikes in his hands or that hoisted the cross. Some may have been the people that mocked him and ridiculed him, but the likelihood of the people listening to this were not the ones who actually crucified Jesus. But what he's saying is, you didn't believe in him enough to accept him as the Christ. And now he's dead and gone. He's back in heaven. And now it's up to you to do something about it. That's what Peter's telling the people. At this point, I want to tie in our scripture reading. Genesis 50, verse 20 says, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Now, that may seem like kind of a strange connection to make from Genesis to Acts, but I want us to see that in, because this is Joseph talking, when his brothers sold him into slavery, and after they had come during the famine and had found him, and he revealed himself to them. He said, all these things that you did that were evil against me, you meant for evil. You hated me, and you didn't want me to be your brother. That's why you sold me into slavery. That's why you thought you'd never see me again, because you didn't want me to be part of your family. But he said, look at what God has done. 
Look at the blessings that God has brought on our family because you acted in evil, but he brought it about for good. I think that has a very easy application to this section in Acts because Peter's saying, look, the Jewish nation as a whole has acted in evil because you came together and you went to the Romans and you crucified the Messiah. But that was part of the plan because God knew that he needed to die in order for you to be forgiven of your sins. So you meant it in evil in your heart. But God always meant it for good. And that through his death, many will be kept alive. Sometimes it seems that we need a rude awakening, like the audience here in Acts chapter 2. A quick example in 2 Samuel 12, 1 through 15. We're not going to go there and read that. Um, but I'm sure you all are familiar with the story of um, when Nathan comes to confront David after he has committed adultery with Bathsheba um, and he has killed Uriah by order in battle. And Uriah comes to him and gives him the story of, of, of a lamb, a man that, a poor man that had a lamb, and there was a rich man that wanted the lamb, so he took it from the poor man and killed it and ate it for dinner, basically, is, is what he says in 2 Samuel. And David gets indignant, and he says, where is this man? He needs to be punished for what he has done. And Nathan says, that man is you. That's just one example of many things in Scripture where people are, are told blatantly that they are the ones that have made a mistake and that they need to correct themselves. In that scripture, David needed to be made aware of what he had done so he could correct his problems and he could obey what the Lord was asking of him. And I believe the same is true in what we see in Acts 2. The people hadn't been told the truth. And it was Peter's job on the day of Pentecost to confront them and say, look, here's what you need to do to make things right. So for the church to begin, the people had to be told what they had done. And for the church to continue to grow and to be what it needs to be today, we need to understand that we are just as guilty of the death of Jesus as those people were in that day. And when Peter says in Acts chapter 2, verse 36... That God has made him both Lord and Jesus, or Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. We need to also think that that's talking to us. Because the guilt and the weight of our sin was on his shoulders when he was crucified as well. Now, as we get ready to close, I want to share some words of a song with you. Now, I don't necessarily know that. Um, I, I like the song being titled Song of Barabbas because I don't think that Barabbas would have ever said these things or thought these things. Um, but I, I would like us to, to read these words and place ourselves in this text to think about what this means to us. Because really, we can stand in the same place as, that, as the early church did, as the Jewish people did on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2, because the weight of Jesus' death is upon us. And it really was our place to die in his stead, but instead he died for us. So I'm going to read these words quickly to you. And I just want you to listen and think intently on what this says. I was sentenced for the crimes that I committed. I received the highest penalty for my wrong. But on execution day, this man took my place. I was released, and now I sing this song. I was freed by a man I did not know. I didn't care about him until I was let go. But he was making a plea as he hung between two thieves. Where was I supposed to go? Oh, thank you, Jesus, for taking my place, for letting me live when I was doomed to death. But you saved my life right in the nick of time by trading places with me you gave your life for mine. Let a guilty man go free and an innocent man die for me. I mean, I'll tell you the truth. When I first read the words to that song, when I was, when I was putting this together, I just sat there 
And I was stunned. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to think. I just sat there and thought, this is me. I was just as responsible for his death as anyone else because I have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and it was his place and God's plan to redeem me. And praise be to God for that. Because nobody else could do it except him. And he was perfect and he was innocent and he took my place when I was his enemy and I was undeserving. But thanks be to God that he had the plan and that he has mercy on us that he would give us forgiveness through the death of his son. So the moral of the story, God has an ultimate active plan. And the, work, and the ways in which God works his plan can be mysterious in some ways and sometimes to us as mere humans. And it's not it's supposed to be the way that we understand everything that God does. That's part of the way that God works. He is such a higher being than us that we're not supposed to understand the things that he does. But his plan included the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And his plan involves me, and it involves you. We deserve to die, but Jesus took our place, and he offers us life instead. So, closing thoughts before we, we wrap this up. Jesus took your place. He took your place on the cross because of what we've done, we deserved to be nailed to the cross. We deserve the punishment that he received. Jesus bore your sin. We know that sin is what separates us from God. And we know that with sin, we can't have an intimate relationship with God like he wants us to have with him. But Jesus took that upon himself on the cross. So because he took your place, and because he bore your sin, my challenge is, what will you do about it? We have to make a decision we can't not react to Jesus and his sacrifice. In Acts chapter 2, Peter is telling the people, and that's what we'll get to next week, you have to make a choice. His blood is on your hands, and it's up to you whether you accept him as your Savior and obey the will of God, or you reject him and disobey God. It's your choice. And it's each and every one of our choices today, too. Because we stand condemned just like them. And we're offered the blood of Jesus, but we have to make a decision what we want from it. You know, maybe, maybe you're a Christian already. And maybe you've done some things that you're not proud of. Maybe you have done some things that you know God is not proud of. And after hearing this, you hear it like the sermon that was preached on Pentecost. And you're convicted to do something. You're convicted to come back to God. Because in all honesty, if we're Christians and we do things that God is not proud of and we don't repent of them, then we really are saying that Jesus isn't my Savior because we're acting like his blood means nothing. And we're saying that he didn't take our place and we don't really care about his sacrifice. And I'm not trying to be harsh by saying that, but I'm saying he died for you. And I believe the least that we could do is try our best to live for him. Now, don't get me wrong. I believe everyone's going to make mistakes. And that's the wonderful thing about the church, that we're here for you, we're here for each other, and we love one another, and we're here to provide guidance and love. Now, maybe you aren't even a part of the church. Maybe you haven't obeyed the gospel yet. Maybe you haven't heard the word and believed it and confessed that Jesus is the Son of God. Maybe you haven't repented of your sins. Maybe you haven't been baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. 
And if you haven't started in that process today, or if you haven't been baptized for the forgiveness of your sins yet, then we would love to help you make that decision and help you grow towards becoming more like Jesus and striving to live because he made a sacrifice for you. Let us all continue to think, even after today, even after next week, after next month, after next year, for the rest of our lives, let us think, he took my place. He bore my sin. I'm going to do something about it. If you need to respond to the invitation, please come always stand. I stand before the crowd, listening for my name. They shall be crucified.
Jeremiah 30, verses 22. And you shall be my people, and I will be your God. This is a phrase that's repeated in many different ways throughout the Bible, um, especially over the Old Testament. We see it in, in Exodus, in Ezekiel, multiple times in Jeremiah, Zechariah, Hosea. This theme of being chosen um, permeates the Bible, of God choosing us and his desire for us to choose him. And as if you paid attention to the lesson, that, that was the word that kept coming to mind is the word chosen, that God has chosen us, that Jesus chose us. And it's interesting what, what Jesus chose us over. He chose us over his comfort, over his own happiness. He chose us over his life. And so even when we feel worthless, we are of value to God. And when we feel alone, we belong to God. Because there's not a better place to be than to be a chosen person of God. And so obviously the question is, if, if God has chosen us, if he's chosen you, do you in turn choose him? Do you say that he will be your God? So today as we reflect on the sacrifice of Jesus and how he chose us, think about the ways that you tried to choose him. Think about the ways that you failed to choose him. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for choosing us. We were undeserving and we still are undeserving. But you loved us enough to send Jesus for us. May we never forget that. And may that motivate us to choose you in every aspect of our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Jesus' blood cleanses us, and it is what allows us to continually choose him. We are so imperfect, and we don't deserve to get the opportunity to do that. But Jesus allows us to do that. Think about how you can be better at choosing him this week and in the future. As you pray and contemplate on his sacrifice, on what that means for you, on what that frees you to do and to, to be, I hope that you think about ways that you can choose him this week. Ways that you can choose him in your actions and the way you interact with each other. Because he's chosen you. And so we must all continually think about how we can choose him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. The opportunity to be free from our sins. To not have to live in guilt or worry. To be able to live a life of, of righteousness and freedom. I pray that we would all choose that, and it's easy to get distracted. It's easy to choose you only when it's convenient. But I pray that we would keep Jesus' sacrifice at the forefront of our minds at all times and let that be our, our motivation and our strength and the reason that we choose you and choose to do what's right. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.